Hey there, Mr. Sutton here with the Precal Honors 9-3 Extra Practice Number 3 Solutions on Algebraic Limits of Polynomial and Rational Functions. On this one, we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 0 of this crazy looking expression. So looking at all these types of functions, we've got, let's see here, cosine, we've got e to the x, those are both continuous functions. We're dividing by 2e to the x, which we know can't have a value of 0. Um, so this is one big continuous function, which means that the limit value and the function value, what I get by just plugging 0 in, are going to be the same thing. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug 0 into this, because these functions are safe to do so. And now that's going to come out to, let's see here, cosine of 0 is 1. e to the 0 is just 1 times 3 is 3, so we're adding 3 up there. And down here, this is really 2 times 1, so just 2 for a grand total of 4 over 2, or just simply 2, giving me choice C. For this problem, they're defining our function as x minus 9 over radical x minus 3, and they want to know what limit as x approaches 9 of f of x is equivalent to. So you'll notice that if you plug in a 9 right away, you get 0 over square root of 9 minus 3, so 0 over 0, which of course is no good. So they're asking us to do some kind of algebraic manipulation on this thing so that when I go ahead and plug in 9 again, I'm not going to get 0 over 0. Okay, so taking a look at my answer choices here, um, there's, there's a few where you don't get 0 over 0 if you plug in 9, so that by itself is not enough to help us. So what do they want us to do algebraically? Well, there's a trick here. Notice that we've got a radical in the denominator, and you were probably taught a long time ago that we don't like radicals in the denominator. We want to get rid of them. The only way to do it when you have two terms is by multiplying the numerator and denominator by something called the conjugate of the denominator. It's basically going to be the same stuff you have in the denominator, only opposite sign in the middle. So I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by radical x plus 3. Now the reason this is going to work out I mean, if I just rewrite this fraction, nothing special is happening in the numerator other than these both get parentheses so I don't lose anything. But in the denominator now, you're basically doing a minus b times a plus b, uh, which always gives us a squared minus b squared. So you're, you're essentially doing radical x squared minus 3 squared, or just simply you get x minus 9. No radical. So that's good news. But there's more good news x minus 9 and x minus 9 are going to cancel out, leaving us with just the limit as x approaches 9 of radical x plus 3. And you actually could go ahead and solve it, but they didn't ask you to. Um, they just actually gave you an answer choice that has this in it, which was choice B. For this problem, we're trying to find limit as x approaches 0 of this rational function. Now just mentally plugging in 0 real quick, you can see that you're going to get 0 in both the numerator and denominator because all the terms have x's in them, so they all get 0'd out when you plug in 0. So that means we're going to have to do some factoring here. Well, since these all have x's in them, we can factor an x out of everything. So in the numerator, I've got x parentheses 7x to the 4th plus 5x plus 12. Doing the same thing in the denominator, that leaves me with x times parentheses 3x to the 4th plus 4. And now those x's can easily cancel out, leaving us with, well, just whatever was in the parentheses. At this point, now that I've canceled out the thing that was giving me 0 over 0, I'm going to go ahead and plug in 0 again to see what happens. When I do that, I'm zeroing out everything except the constants at the very ends here. So we end up with essentially 12 over 4, which we can reduce to 3 to match the answer choice C. For this problem, we're given that f of x equals sine of x minus 1 over cosine squared of x, and we want to know what limit of this thing as x approaches pi over 2 is equivalent to. So they want us to rearrange this algebraically, trigonometrically, um, for some reason. Now, the reason they want us to rearrange it, if, if you actually plug in pi over 2, you'll end up with, let's see, this is going to be 1 minus 1 over 0 squared, if you plug pi over 2 into all of that. Um, basically, 0 over 0, which is no good. So the key to this one is this cosine squared can be turned into something else. There's a Pythagorean identity. You might remember sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. 
that means that cosine squared and 1 minus sine squared are the same thing. So we can replace cosine squared with 1 minus sine squared. So those, that's where your uh, trig identities are actually coming in handy. So we're going to go a little bit further here, because this doesn't solve the problem. Um, if you plug in pi over 2, now you just have 1 minus 1 squared, which is still a mess down there. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try factoring this a little bit. In the numerator, I can factor out a negative to give me 1 minus sine of x. In the denominator, I can turn this into 1 plus sine of x, 1 minus sine of x. We essentially have a squared minus b squared. So a plus b times a minus b is equivalent to that. And once I've done this, I notice that these 1 minus sine of x's cancel. So this really can be rewritten as negative 1 over 1 plus sine of x as x approaches pi over 2. And it looks like that is going to give us answer choice A. We could actually go a little further and find the limit, but they didn't ask us to, so we'll stop there. For this problem, we have a function defined by this complex fraction, and we want to know what the limit as x approaches one of this thing's equivalent to. Now, the reason they want something equivalent, so they're, they're asking us to do some kind of algebraic maneuvering here, is if you plug in one right away, you just end up with 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1, which is 0 over 0. Um, so we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So to do this, I'm essentially going to simplify this fraction. I'll start by combining the numerator into one big fraction using common denominators. So I can think of this as 1 minus x minus x over x, which I can merge into 1 minus x over x. And then, uh, a few things I can do here. I can factor a negative 1 out of this term here to get negative 1 parentheses x minus 1. And I can also uh, multiply by the reciprocal, so multiply this fraction by 1 over x minus 1, so that I end up with an x times x minus 1 now in my denominator. Now the nice thing about this is that these x minus 1s are going to cancel, leaving us with negative 1 over x which I see if I plugged in 1, now I wouldn't have 0 over 0. Um, but we didn't have to plug in 1, we just had to pick the equivalent limit, which is choice A. On this one, we're given f and g such that limit as x approaches 4 of g is 2, and limit as x approaches 4 of f divided by g is pi. Based off this, we want limit of x approaching 4 of f of x. Um, so the key here is that when you have a quotient of two limits, you can take their limits separately, um, assuming, of course, that the bottom limit does not equal 0. So since we already know that the limit of g at, at x equals 4 is 2, we can rewrite this equation here as a limit as x approaches 4 of f of x over 2 equals pi. So essentially swapping out g with 2 because I know the limit at 4 of g is 2. Well, all I'm really solving for here, if, if you think about this carefully, is limit as x approaches 4 of f of x. So I just have to isolate this limit up here in the numerator, and then I've solved the problem. Well, to do that, all I have to do is multiply both sides by this 2 here that g turned into. Um, so then we can say limit as x approaches 4 of f of x equals just simply 2 pi. And that is going to be answer choice C. For this problem, we're given a table with selected values of the f function and also a graph of f, which is a line and a parabola and this other random dot thrown in there. So basically, on this problem, we want to know the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. Um, so let's use a little process of elimination to start off with here. So we know that as x approaches 3 from the left side and the right side, we are heading towards this open dot. Um, so there, there's definitely some y value that is our limit. We're heading toward the same place. So choice D, the limit does not exist, is not an acceptable answer because we can see it clearly does exist. We just have a removable kind of discontinuity here, a hole. We know the limit exists at holes. All right, so what else can we eliminate? Well, we're looking for the open dot. We're looking for the projected Y value of the open dot, not the solid dot. The solid dot is not where the graph is heading. That has a value of 2, but that's really f of 3, not limit as x approaches 3 of f. So we can eliminate choice C as well, because that's not what the limit represents. But here's the trouble. How do we pick between 1.6 and 1.602? You can't really tell just by looking at the graph which one it should be. So for that, we have to also look at the table. As we look at our table here, 
it looks like as we get closer to 3 from the left side with the x values, our y values are getting smaller, 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 uh, and the next y value is going to have to be smaller still after 1.601 because if you look at the graph, as you come from the left side, you're decreasing that whole time until you get to x equals 3. Now, as we come from the right side, we're also getting smaller and smaller as we head towards x equals 3, and you can see that on the graph. These y values are decreasing from the right side as well. So this is the key. The y values are decreasing from both directions. So when you're just looking at these y values, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, 1.601, 1.603, hey, 1.602 is right between those. There's my limit. But that's not accurate because the value between here, the value at x equals 3 that these are approaching, has to be a number less than both of these. You're decreasing in y values from both sides. So whatever value you're projected to reach at x equals 3 has to be smaller than these surrounding values. It's the smallest value in this area of the graph. So for that reason, um, our limit as we approach from the left side has to be 1.6, not 1.602, because it's got to be something smaller. And our limit as we approach from the right side also going to have to be 1.6. We're decreasing down to this value. That means our two-sided limit from both sides is going to be 1.6. Um, so we're going to have to pick choice A, as tempting as B would have been. For this problem, we have an h function defined as x squared minus 7 over x minus 3. We want to know which of these statements is true. So these are a bunch of statements where, as you approach from the left or the right, you're going to one infinity or another. Um, I think we can definitely agree, because we have this x minus 3 here, that we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. Um, there's no way to cancel out this x minus 3 with the numerator. So this is a vertical asymptote rather than a whole. So that means we're heading towards one infinity or another. But this question is asking us specifically which infinity we're heading toward from each side. Just saying it's a vertical asymptote and the limit does not exist is not going to cut it with the amount of detail they wanted on this problem. So the key to figuring out which way we're going from each side is to plug in some x values that are as close as possible to this x value 3. Um, although that's not going to tell us necessarily where the graph is going because you could always move closer in, it's going to be a pretty good guide. Um, because, because you're going to infinity in one direction or another as you get closer to 3, um, that means you're going to be rising very, very steeply. So no matter how far above or below the x-axis you start, as you get closer and closer to 3, eventually your function is going to show its true colors and you're either going to be very positive or very negative for your output, depending on which infinity you're heading towards. So to figure out the left side, I'm going to plug in 2.9. I could also plug in 2.99999, whichever one I want to do. Um, if I plug in anything like that, just looking to see what happens in my graph, plugging in something like 2.9 or 2.999, that's going to give me uh, something definitely close to 9 up here. So subtracting 7 from that is going to give me a positive in the numerator. 2.999 minus 3 is going to be a negative in the denominator. Positive over negative means I have a negative overall result. That means that I must be heading towards negative infinity as I approach 3 from the left side. Now from the right side, let me plug in something like 3.1, or you could do 3.00001. You'll, you'll reach the same conclusion on this graph anyway. So plugging in something a little bit bigger than 3, squaring that and subtracting 7, we still get a positive numerator. Denominator, though, something bigger than 3 minus 3 is also positive. So that's a positive overall result for something bigger than 3, which means that I must be heading towards positive infinity as x approaches 3 from the right side. So taking a look at my answer choices, we want negative and then positive, and it looks like that's going to be answer choice C. On this problem, we have a function defined for all x in the interval 4 to 6. We want to know which statement, if true, would tell us that limit as x approached 5 of f of x was 17. So going through these, the first one, they're saying there's some g function that x is, or f is always less than, and the limit of g is 17. Well, this doesn't really tell us that f of x has to be approaching 17 
as we get closer to 5. Um, because if f of x is always lower than g, it could be like 100 or 1,000 units lower. We're, we're not guaranteed we're going to get to this same y value. By the same token, if we have the roles reversed where g is smaller than f, now f could be uh, thousands of units above the g function. So again, we're not guaranteed that we have to come back down to 17. So a and b we can very quickly eliminate. Now c is a little bit interesting. They're saying there's two functions, g and h, and that g is sandwiched between f and h, and that the limits of g and h are both 17. Well, this is kind of interesting, um, but this is kind of just like choice A, where f of x was less than some function that had a limit of 17. Now f of x is less than two functions that both have a limit of 17. But again, f of x could be hundreds of units below these functions, so this doesn't force f of x to take on a limit of 17 as we get closer to 5. And then we come to this last one. This one's a little different because now f of x is sandwiched between these two functions, g and h. So if f is between g and h on this interval here, and we're finding the limit at, at some value that's on that interval, if we're told that these two functions are both approaching 17 and f is guaranteed to be between them, that means that f has to also be approaching 17 at whatever x value those other two functions were approaching 17 at. Um, so by the squeeze theorem, this is using the squeeze theorem of calculus or the sandwich theorem, we're guaranteed that f sandwiched between these also has to reach 17 at that exact, or it has to approach 17 at that, that x value. So then, when all is said and done, that ends up being choice d. On this problem, we're given the function g is this rational function, h is this other rational function, and then there's a third function, because you don't already have enough to worry about, f, that they're telling us this is between the g and the h functions on the interval from 0 to 5. So what's the limit of as x approaches 2, which I'll note is between 0 and 5, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of this f function? Well, they don't really tell us much algebraically about what f is doing. We know a whole bunch about g and h. The only thing we know about f is that it's between g and h. So really, there's nothing else we can do except find the limit of g and h as x approaches 2 and hope that whatever numbers we get out of that give us a little bit more clarity about f, which has to be between g and h. So let me start by taking limit as x approaches 2 of the g function. So to do that, I'm just going to uh, plug in 2 for all the x values here. There's nothing I can cancel out, so we might as well just plug in at this point. So that's going to give me 14 minus 26, which is going to be negative 12 over negative 3. So that's 4. All right, so let's see what happens with h now if we take that limit at 2. So limit as x approaches 2 of h plugging in 2 for those x values. We end up with, let's see here, 6 plus 14 is 20, 4 plus 1 is 5, 20 over 5 is also 4. Well, that's interesting. So this is actually very helpful. We know that f of x is always between or equal to g and h for all values between 0 and 5. So that means that if g and h have the same output, the same limit on this interval here, that means f, which is sandwiched between g and h, must also have that limit. It has no choice but to have a value of 4 because it's always between or equal to these functions. So by the squeeze theorem, that's what we're using here, by the squeeze theorem, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x must also equal 4, giving us choice b. On this problem, f is some function of x, and the value as x approaches a of f of x can be found using the squeeze theorem with the functions g and h. All right, they're giving us that this is a fact. So based off of that, which could be a graphical representation of these three functions, f, g, and h? So basically, they're looking for a graph that demonstrates the squeeze theorem in action. Okay, um, so this means that at least near the x value a, f has to be between the g and the h functions. So sandwiched between them be near x equals a. So looking at our graphs here, 
Uh, graph A, f of x, as we get closer to A, is definitely not sandwiched between the, the h and the g function, right? It, it, it crosses them, but it's not really trapped between them as we get closer there. So A is no good. With B, it, it's kind of sandwiched between them as we approach from the left side, but then the right side, the f function escapes. The f function is this, uh, this bolded line here. The f function escapes and is no longer sandwiched between coming from the right side. Um, so B is also not really a good choice there. C, we're definitely between the two functions, so we'll leave that in the running, um, although we're not as, as, as close together as I would like. With D, we're also sandwiched between the two functions throughout the whole course here. Um, so D is also an acceptable answer at this point. So it's A and B that we're eliminating. But we can go a little bit further. The squeeze theorem only works if G and H, the two functions that F is between, have the exact same limit. Otherwise, we can't really nail down what the limit of F is other than saying it's between the two limits of these functions. Um, so since G and H have to have the same limit for the squeeze theorem to do its thing, that means that choice C where H and G are so far apart here is not a good candidate for demonstrating the squeeze theorem. So we can rule that one out. Choice D, on the other hand, H and G clearly equal the same thing as you get closer to A. Um, so we can definitely figure out and pinpoint F of X using the squeeze theorem on choice D. So that's the answer choice we're going with.